Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. I'm Ivy Kano. From the kidnapping spray that saw dozens abducted in one week to all out attacks on state institutions, just how far this current high tide of insecurity will go, it's something that very few can guess. But if there's one fear that is uniting many, it is that if reasonable action is not taken in time, events may get out of control. Already news of communities being overrun by terrorists and extremists who have hoisted their flag does not offer any form of comfort. As a matter of fact, out of 23 students of Greenfield University who were kidnapped from their campus in Kaduna, five have been killed in two batches. In the southeast, police checkpoints and courthouses have become targets for faceless groups who are cashing in and making wanton killings and destruction an all-commerce affair. That is not to mention the revelation made by Niger state governor that Abuja, the nation's capital, is now within range of a Boko Haram attack. Let's take this report. The situation in Gaidam Yobe state is still dicey in the aftermath of an invasion by Aswa fighters who have occupied the town despite attempts by security forces to push the insurgents back. Thousands have been displaced in the three-day siege worsening the humanitarian situation in the northeast. About 275 kilometers southwest, residents of Minoc in Kaga Council area of Bono State grapple with fear in the aftermath of an ambush on Nigerian Army Special Forces. And the emerging confusion between the land and air force has caused a serious setback to efforts to repel the attack, even though the Chief of Army Staff has commended the air force of troops. The security challenge got even more worrisome with the abduction of students of the Federal University of Agriculture, Makodi, on Sunday, 24 hours ahead of a condolence visit by a delegation of the Kaduna State Government to families of the Greenfield University students killed after they were abducted by gunmen. At the opening of a workshop in Mina, the state capital, on Monday, Governor Abubakar Bello said 50 villages in five local government areas of the state have been deserted due to bandit attacks. The situation is critical and it's terrible. Uh, last night, uh, we had over 3,000 people here from communities that have been displayed by bandits and Boko Haram elements around uh, Munya and Shiro local governments. In fact, I just heard uh, they've already placed their flag in, uh, in Kauri, so which means they've taken over the territory. Down south, the security situation is equally grim. Eight law enforcement agents were killed over the weekend and their weapons stolen by their assailants near the River State capital, Port Harcourt. Neighboring Imo, Anambra and Enugu states have been sucked into the fray of daring attacks on security facilities. And the country home of the Imo state governor also took a hit. The worsening security situation prompted a second meeting of the Southeast Governors on Sunday to firm up the establishment of a regional security outfit to stem the tide. Some of the agreements reached include a ban on open grazing, support for restructuring of Nigeria and establishment of state police. In spite of efforts to reverse the security misfortunes, the approach appears to be yielding little results. Fleeing residents of Gaydam community in Yobe state are recounting their ordeal after the community came under heavy attack of Boko Haram insurgents and fell to the terrorists. Among them is Mohammed Lawan, who had to trek a long distance while scampering for safety. He says the number of insurgents who attacked Gaydam outnumbered the military personnel stationed in the town. Mohammed Lawan trekked many kilometers as he scampered to safety from a community now under the control of insurgents. He says the attackers have numbered the soldiers stationed at military outposts in Gaydam community. They have pushed every one of, uh, every one of our people into the home. They were just crossing all over the towns. After some days, uh, after some hours, military have come in time to enter inside the town and meet them, they were even exchanging fire, but they are much, they are much more than the soldiers that was there. The horror is real. They felt it when Boko Haram struck on Friday. The sporadic shelling 
caused an unconfirmed number of deaths, including 11 people from the same family. Mohammed Usman was the only one lucky to be alive. He is still unable to come to terms with reality. The military says normalcy has returned to the town. But Mohamed Lawan and many others that trekked kilometers to get to safety insist the attackers are still in control of Gaydam community. Even right now, sir, they are inside the town. Maybe in the morning, they were exchanging fire. But now, I cannot tell you that they have taken over the Gaydam, but they are inside the Gaydam. Because there are some people there, some people, some, uh, some civilians are there. And even Boko Haram, they are there also, the soldiers are still there. It seems despite the recent change of guard in military hierarchy and assurances that the insurgency will be completely halted, the attacks have become even more fierce, leaving residents in a state of helplessness and hopelessness. I time that the government, especially the military and other security agencies, move out of their comfort zone to go after these boys instead of staying to be defending some of these territories. It's no longer uh, safe, it's no longer sustainable. I think they will have to move outside of, of their defense areas to, to be able to tackle these boys once and for all. Now from River State comes our next story where killing of security personnel at strategic checkpoints has forced the state government to impose a curfew. Nine officers of the Nigerian Police, Air Force and the Customs Service lost their lives when gunmen attacked four checkpoints in the Huere local government area of the state. It is the latest incident in a wave of violent attacks on security agencies in the southeast and south-south regions of the country this year. The end is not in sight to the circle of violence in the south-south and southeast region. Security personnel are now targets of mindless gunmen. Few meters away from the Port Harcourt International Airport is the first joint military task force checkpoint that was attacked on the Omagwa Elele stretch of the Port Harcourt Oweri Expressway. Eyewitnesses say three police officers and one Air Force personnel were killed here. That day I brought food. I came late. I brought food to them. They, even the one they caught his head, if they check that place, even the food that man ate did not digest. Some of the food came poured on the ground where his blood was there. So I'm, I'm the person that used to give them food from point to point. As the entire state grapples with the shock caused by the killings, residents of the area are in need of reassurances that their communities are safe. The poop two soldiers guide the kid, they are not even married. It pains my heart that the, the parents release their, their children for government to go for work. At the end, what they are receiving back is their dead body. So anything the government will do to stop this, let them do it. The exact number of Nigerian customs officers manning this second checkpoint at the time of the attack at Ubima Junction is unclear. But three of them were gunned down by the assailants who also cutted away their service rifles and patrol vehicles. We are here when the group of men come here, young men with the black uh, dress, they dress black like that mafia. So with their rifle. So when they come here, they surrender the custom. Many business owners and customers say they barely escaped as the sounds of sporadic gunfire filled the air. The way the ability was standing itself, you can't stand and recognize somebody. You understand? The people would go, go with the full force that he cannot withstand watching at them. So why all of us ran away because of the fly bullet? Eyewitness account puts the death toll from the attack on this third checkpoint at two one police officer and one Air Force personnel. At the fourth checkpoint, no one was killed, but property belonging to officers and civilians were touched. All four checkpoints are within 20 kilometers of this axis of the expressway, requiring about 15 minutes to drive from the first to the last. But the gunmen operated for two hours with little resistance, raising questions about existing strategies by security agencies for communication and reinforcement.
No doubt Nigeria is confronted with multiple challenges that continually threaten peace and stability, from terrorism to separatist agitations and attacks on law enforcement agents. The grim situation is pushing the country into disturbing tension. I had a chat with former director of the state security service, Mike Ejiofo. He says a more pragmatic approach needs to be adopted to stem the tide of insecurity at this time. Development that uh, in our country we seem to be overwhelmed. There are a lot of security challenges. Virtually all the geopolitical zones have its own peculiar problem. In the northeast, like you pointed out, we have an uh, insurgency in the north central. The, the, that's insurgency we've been contending with in the northeast. Then you go to the northwest and north central. You are talking of banditry and uh, kidnapping. The recent one now is in the southeast where there's a strong agitation. That's, even though there's agitation in the southwest, the one in the south is, is stronger now because uh, it, it's gradually developing into insurgency where uh, sensitive installations like the correctional service, the police headquarters, and the uh, um, sensitive installations have been attacked. It calls for real worry. And uh, as a security uh, a consultant, I am disturbed and very uh, that uh, we are degenerating to this level. I'm disturbed. Uh, no country fights a civil war and survives it a second time. We have uh, gone through civil war, and uh, before this agitation by these youths, the IPOB people who are not, who did not even witness the civil war. And I cautioned when the uh, when the IPOB was to be proscribed, I advised against it. And uh, when uh, the Operation Python dance was launched in the southeast. I advise against it that it's better to engage the elders and the leaders of the various uh, uh, groups in that area to dialogue. Because if you push these people underground, it becomes very difficult for government to manage. And this is exactly what we are facing now. Even though IPOP is coming out to deny involvement of all what that is going on. So it's a, it's a, it's a worrisome development. Without sounding like a, a broken record, I I think um, we need to re-strategize our security and uh, rejig our security architecture. You know, a lot of people have been calling for change of uh, leadership in the various uh, uh, security agencies which the government has uh, infected, but uh, the things seem not to be abating. So what I think uh, we should do is to localize the solution of our problems. In still, what you use in bringing a solution for peace in North East cannot be used in the Northwest. So we have to look at peculiar problems, the way they come, and profile solutions. I'll give you an example. There's no way we can succeed in this war without uh, having the locals getting involved, the members of the community getting involved. By that, I mean that we should be able to localize the police. A situation where you have people from different geopolitical zones, people who don't understand the language, they have a language difference, cultural difference, religious biases, and uh, you deploy them to area they don't even have a knowledge on what to do. It becomes a problem. That is why it is very, very important that the government sets in motion, any motion, the issue of, um, uh, uh, state police, I believe that that's the best way to go. Although some people have reservations that uh, it will be abused. But uh, without trial, there's no way we can uh, we can know whether they, they, they are false. If they are false, then we can correct them.
the challenge I have in government approach is that uh, where government is supposed to be negotiating, they are not negotiating. Where they are not supposed to be negotiating, they are negotiating. Take, for instance, the issue of banditry and kidnapping. These people have no ideology. They have nothing on table to say this is what is uh, what our grievances are. But if you go to the South, and yet government is still negotiating and paying money, even though no government will come out to say yes, that we are paying ransom. Then you go to the South, which is their, their, their demands are political. I feel that government should have also engaged them in negotiation to see or dialogue, whatever it is involving the leaders, the political leaders, the religious leaders in that zone to get everybody on the table to say, how do we solve this problem? Because uh, the people who are involved in this are youths who are not even aware of the consequences of their, of their action. So I think uh, various approaches, government should negotiate in terms of political and economic reasons, but with banditry that uh, the people have no, no nothing on the table. I, I, I don't encourage uh, negotiations. Thank you.